I've been knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Extraordinarily rich morning um, from all our speakers. And we seem to have shifted from staging mixed realities to something which is much more fundamental about aesthetics and belief and the way in which we are being manipulated by the um, techno futurist industry of, you know, and it's, it's actually a, a, a real degree of cynicism. Uh, or scepticism, not cynicism, scepticism about how these 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 um, the, the new materials, if you like, are being are being used. But also, what was so interesting is the the materiality of the or both of you of your um, talks and and the, the way Arnold put it in the historical context. There's this sense that the, the materials mixing with these new it's kind of a kind of new mix of materials, but one which we have to be very wary of in terms of its. Influence and you talked about belief and Homo sapiens, which I've just finished, and how our whole world is constructed on these kind of myth myths, and that there is a danger that the myths of the, the, the future techno world is something that we've all bought into or are being manipulated by. So I'm not going to say I, I'd like to open it up because you haven't got very long, so you don't want to listen to me. Um, do you, yes, we've got Tim. Is it Tim? Yes. Yeah. So put your hands up and I'll get. Yeah, I've got an observation for each of the three speakers, so I'll speak very fast. Okay. And a bit younger. Um, Arnold, in, in your paper, you talked um, about layers as well as a continuum. I, I thought layers was a particularly useful way of thinking about this, particularly if you turn to the, the notion of way, the way layers are conceived in Photoshop, where there's different blend modes, and with the way in which one layer can affect another in quite surprising ways, so the interdependency of um, the real and then the ways in which you might augment or impose something else on the top of it. Um, with your paper, Roma, um, I was really interested in your work in the early years because um, I wondered whether, if, if you take the model of layers, whether at that stage they are discrete, whether there's the ability to discern one from the other, or whether they so interpenetrate and are so kind of permeable that it exists more as a continuum or like a meter strip where we don't actually recognize that this is mixed reality and then this is mundane quotidian life. And then finally, Dick, with your paper, uh, very much grounded in the notion of the um, fetishization of tech, um, but it, it made me think that um, is there not a distinction between tech saturation, which we might call um, mixed reality, and the current reality we exist in, which is at least tech infused? And one could equally propose that mixed reality might exist perhaps in an eco-retreat or on a, a luxury island where the removal of tech, which is so um, mundane and ever-present, is actually creating a disjunction between the way we live our lives and um, a kind of notion that we can exist without this. So there might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's... So I'm, I'm going to address Arnold's um, observation, but that's all right. <laughs> Um, yeah, the idea of, because uh, you mentioned blend modes, and I have kind of like muscle memory in my left hand for switching between blend modes in software, because, I, you know, you have like 22 different blend modes in Photoshop that follow on into After Effects, that follow on into live programming software, and when I'm working with multi-layers of media, I want to flick through all those options for blending them on stage, so I just tap through them like this, and it's kind of, uh, until you get one that you like, but, so the technology makes all these things available, um, but sort of as, as I sort of said on one of my points, that those 21 options or whatever in Photoshop are predetermined by a software developer, and so um, and they might not reflect the kind of reality that I'm actually trying to create. So you kind of you just it, it, you're kind of stuck between having lots of different choices, but they're not unlimited. And and only by working through them with, by being, and what you see on your screen when you're editing is different to what you see when you're on stage with a director and lighting and sound and, and all the materiality of the stage. So um, the process for me is, is, is kind of um, experimenting with those options in the context of the actual staging to then discover what it is that actually might meaningfully contribute to the narrative, the story, um, the performance, what the director wants, and what everybody else is doing on stage. Um, 
So yeah, and I just thought it was an interesting thing for you to pick up on with all the blend mines, because that's my bread and butter. <laughs> One of the things that fascinated me listening to you is if you go back to roughly the 1960s or whatever, when uh, sort of three-dimensional textured scenery started to replace painting and certainly commercial theater, and designers became very aware of the textures of the call of the materials they were using on stage, which of course has an effect on the audience, uh, even if it's, it's subconscious. And here you are focusing on the texture of the projection surface and then filming and reprojecting on that. And I just thought that that was utterly fascinating, uh, which has to do with that whole idea of layering. Robert, do you want to come in? <laughs> I think in, in terms of the of uh, using uh, sensors or sensor based systems in there, it just yes, it just becomes another material or another texture within or another layer within the scenography that blends in there. But it doesn't and yes, maybe they, they it's another way that they they're looking or using any kind of technology when they are playing with the work than I do. Um, it's different if they have the screen in front of them, they use the same tech and they will get the similar experience. So in some way, the, their screen that they're all involved in right, um, will allow them to do that sort of movement or, or allow some sort of level of interaction. But then the work we are doing is trying to see whether in the real world, some of that becomes part of the real world, not only on a flat screen base. Okay, I'm going to move on because there's going to be more questions, I know. Yes, yes, I know. So you uh, brought the book. Thank you that you addressed the issue of um, spectacle and entertainment um, and the Baroque aesthetic that we see that usually is adopted when theater is in place. Uh, now, I, like, I might add one more layer of skepticism to that because that some of the examples that we were looking at were opera and theater where there is a sense, like there is still um, some um, sense of entertainment as a role, like of the art itself. And then I'm in my head thinking of performances such as contemporary dance, where you see examples like the ones that you've shown being used less um, and probably because of the funding. So my question is how do, what is our responsibility or how can we and essentially even train the producers or the audience to appreciate a more sophisticated aesthetic than just the one that creates the Gina uh, Liz effect. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see how op in opera and theater is easier because you have a captured, uh, sorry, a captivated audience <coughs> that they will come anyways, and those are willing to pay up to 200 pounds for a tick for a seat versus contemporary dance that could be, I don't know, 50, maybe 70 pounds a ticket. Can it, one thought that um, I agree that much dance, just by the nature of dance, does not necessarily go in for spectacular scenery, but I know that a lot of contemporary dance is using motion capture technology, mm -hmm. uh, in which you've got the, you know, the sensors on the body of the dancers, which then result in other kinds of images and projections. Uh, so uh, I, I think it is being used to some extent. Uh, is, 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 what, you know, is what's behind that question also this notion of where is the sort of criticality in, yes, in this yeah. work? Where is the self-reflection? Does it kind of play with itself? I'm, I'm thinking of that piece we had in the journal, mm -hmm. that, that piece that Gobsworth did, mm -hmm. which is all about integrating <coughs> technology and then kind of dis, sort of displacing that and going back to something which is people in the room, which is making people aware of the kind of manipulations, the visual spe spectatorial um, manipulations that go on. With, uh, that's just one example of one company, Gobsworth. Can I, oh, go ahead. Yep. I was going to just one sort of anecdotal thing. This goes back to Women in White. Mm -hmm. uh, with, I saw it on Broadway. Uh, and most of us have that experience, whether in opera or musical theater, when the, uh, the stage is revealed and there's a spectacular set and the audience will applaud. It's, isn't that wonderful? Um, and so here was what was certainly one of the first uses of digital scenery that, that 
I was aware of. I went specifically to just see how that worked. And so during the intermission, I was kind of eavesdropping on the audience to see what they were talking about. There was no response to it at all because this was an audience that was already suffused in the screen and digital technology. And so seeing digital scenery, but what's, what's so great about that? There was that kind of, we were already suffused in that. So I'm gonna just... Yeah, so, oh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. oh sorry, no, I was just gonna um, address that, the question. Um, you, you, you said uh, responsibility towards producers and... What? Producers and audiences. Are yeah. I mean, I, I, I sometimes, I sometimes feel that occasionally um, some producers are kind of sold on an idea that they're going to improve or increase or get younger audiences by in, involving the technology in some way because there's some kind of like holy grail of kind of like we need younger audiences, therefore we need more technology because that's what they're familiar with, and, and somebody will sell that idea to the producers, and but. But it doesn't address any of the issues of, of, of um, what you were saying, the sort of criticality of it, and, and, and how the medium could or should or could be experimented. Just, just having it there doesn't mean you increase or get a younger audience. It still has to be an engaging piece of theatre. It still has to be an interesting performance, story, whatever. whatever. Um, and and I'm off, I often feel a bit sceptical about how the technology is, is used um, to kind of tick a few boxes without actually addressing and building it fundamentally into the, the writing and the rehearsal process that precedes everything else. And just the, but I don't really get the point in the dance thing because somebody like Wayne McGregor has been using with random dance and then with Royal Ballet has been using... That's like Royal Opera. Hmm? Um, yeah, but, but contemporary dance, um, with, with random dance, you know, he, he, I remember doing something with Wayne McGregor in like the early 90s um, with projection when he was sort of doing small experimental pieces. Um, I, think, I think the difference is that, is that in dance, the, the, obviously the primacy of the choreographer, self-evidently, is, is, is important, and the choreographers are less involved, less, less, often less concerned with the sort of the backdrop, but obviously they're focused on the movement. And so when they use the technology, they want to use live cameras and they want to use motion tracking and they want to put the digital technology into the, the sort of bodily space of the performer as a choreographer, rather than putting something necessarily just on a backdrop as part of the stage set. So there's a kind of different engagement with the technology because of what they're doing, fundamentally what they're doing. Can I do this question? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, down in Hammersmith. Mm. And what struck me as incredibly meaningful is that when the character played by Simon McQuarrie was on stage thinking about the woman he loved, played by Catherine Hartley, you just saw an image coming on his chest of the face of the woman he loved. And it was so meaningful within the context of the theatre. It did, you know, it, talking about your work, taking it in the theatre and how you're building these two, it's about somehow creating aliveness and the use of the technology. And also two other examples that really moved me in film were Alfred Hitchcock in 1956 in um, Dial M for Murder, when he uses a controlled bespoke amount of 3D at the moment when um, she answers the phone, she's about to be murdered. And you see it in cinema, it's extraordinary, but it's only like three minutes of 3D. And then Ben Benders with Pina, going back to the question of dance, mm. when he used 3D in essentially an art documentary that is a dance documentary about and about, which is when you watch it, you have the dance of seeing it just, you know, dancing out into the auditorium. It was extraordinary. But where do you see the possibilities are for the essence of the artist who is behind the technology to come to the forefront and for us not to be over, for, for the artists involved in the work, of whom I'm sure everyone in the room is an artist or a creator if connected to the creation of this art, how can we not be be zumped by this fetish, fetishized nature 
Mm, well, yeah, have a great difficulty. Um, I, mean, go on, Roma. I think you have to. I think you have to be as artists to engage in it one, so that you know what mm. and how, and you can talk from a, a, a level of authority about something. Mm -hmm. So you really have to get your hands dirty, like you could with paint or any other medium. You would be getting it. The the other thing I, I I think you need to do is that don't see them as the other. You've got to really work with the kind of sense that. A scientist or a technologist is a creative person as well and you've got to begin to kind of you know find in your team that you it's not them and us you the initial thing is to be begin to work together in that sense and for me i think that's it i work with creative technologists and we make sure we use the word creative technology because they're inputting the in the work in the design they are in, interested in it they may be more technology minded than i am and I kind of code what they do, but I could do a little bit of coding that allows me to understand what is possible and who to talk to. And, to, and, and I think it's that it's for so, long, so long when I started digital in, in 97, it's so times there's this fight in theater about digital against theater. And I think there is not that. There shouldn't, there's a sense that there's, it's a, there's a medium, there's a medium. If I want to use that media, how am I going to do it? And it's not about, really, it's about this sense of, uh, I don't know. And your PhD sits within science, doesn't it? Yes, it sits within the science, science department. department, which is quite interesting, I think. It's, it's the, I mean, but Mnemonic is a good case in point, because um, actually it was, being, it was developed here. Um, I don't know if it was ever performed here, but it was certainly, I, I missed a trick there, because um, whilst, it was, whilst it was in rehearsal here, I was working on, Coast of Utopia that became Woman in White. And some of my colleagues actually were, I told them to go and look after Simon McBurney because he's a pain in the neck. But, <laughs> it's kind of, um, but they then built, built their careers on having started to work with him at Complicite. And Annabelle Arden, who directed all of those operas, that was part of Complicite as well. Um, and what's interesting about Simon and Complicite and Annabelle is that they build it fundamentally into their rehearsal and experimentation process. The cameras, the projectors, um, they're in the rehearsal room from day one, and so you're engaging with them as performers, they're, they're devising, so the, the script isn't limiting the use of the technology, they're not limiting the use of the technology, it's in the room from the beginning, and you get what you get at the end of it. Um, so it's kind of integrated into the development of the piece, and that's kind of, for me, what works best. So maybe the creative technology should become a new dramaturg, Yeah, I, I just think that the definite defining the terms and what the pe what those people the fact behaving under those terms that that's the problem. It's like you're the dramaturg, you're the technologist, you're the creative technologist, you're the it's it's you know you're pigeonholing people, and and what you need to be doing is not generating the boundaries of what different people are supposed to be doing. But how close can you get to say software? To software developers. I mean, you seem to be saying you can get close. You see it as a, I, I get the sense of kind of frustration that the palettes yeah. are like limited, yeah. or limiting in terms of what you can do. But how can you get, can you get well, close the, the, to the software um, The woman in white is a, is, a, is a case in point because we were trying to do something with the woman in white um, because of what the set designer wanted to do. Uh, and we had to write the software in order to be able to track in real time three dimensional stage movements. The, basically the set had a revolve on it, but it had a double revolve. So bits on the set could go in opposite directions, but also the back wall of the, uh, of the enclosing uh, back wall of the scenery could track forward onto the revolve. So you had a, a curved, what would be um, a uh, concave surface coming forward onto a revolve that, can, that could then rotate and present a convex surface downstage, a concave surface upstage, and an even further concave. So, and, and then, but the imagery had to track that. So, you, you're, so you had to generate a software that was programmable, and could track the stage scenery and perform all those geometric kind of changes. And um, we had somebody write some software for us. Um, but then, when you've got 
Andrew Lloyd Webber dissatisfied with some connection between the music and the image, and Trevor Nunn wanting somebody to do something with a magician to make something happen for this, that, and the other. And you've got a programmer who can't keep up with the video programming, and then a, a blip in the software that needs to be rewritten for a bit of code in order to make it happen. And then you, you might have to wait 24 hours for that to happen, but, by, but then you've moved on to a different scene, and then you're, you, you can never catch up. And that, that was what was frustrating, it's, it, because everybody's demanding it like here, now, like I want it now. And you know, and, and you work into a tight schedule, and the, 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 the technical rehearsal process on the stage doesn't really allow for that. But we had five weeks, and you know, which is unheard of, to, to do technical rehearsals. But you know, for a theatre in the West End to be closed for five weeks, it, it's commercial suicide. Um, so you don't get that time. And, and so if you're dependent on somebody coding and a programmer learning the code in order to, it, it's, just, it, it's just the time constraints, ultimately. You don't have the time to work through all of the consequences in the way that you would need to do in order to get um, a, a better result or, or that satisfies all of the critical dialogue that's going on. I keep thinking of the, um, the hierarchy of a means of expression, you know, that the Appius statement that all the material says a kind of hierarchy of orders in terms of what's important and what mm. you know, I suppose there's a sense that you're having to fit in with so many other things that are going on. Yeah, yeah. And yet what you do fundamentally takes such a long time. Mm. I'm being told by Gabriella that I have to stop. I think, is that what tea means? It's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we did run over, but I thought that was worth it. Can I just thank all our people this morning?